And welcome to Candidates Night October 2018. Uh, the first venue, or the first part of this venue, will be the state representative candidates. And uh, I just want to explain a few things, uh, kind of the rules of the road. Uh, it'll apply for both uh, state representative candidates and selectman candidates. Uh, ca candidates will be allowed a, a two minute opening statement. Uh, we will then go to a question and answer period. Uh, questions uh, can be answered up to one minute. There will be rebuttals for up to 30 seconds. Then the candidates will be allowed two minutes for a closing statement. There will be no questions from the audience for the state representative candidates who are requests for time. The selectman candidates, uh, we will uh, have some questions from the audience. There have been index cards passed uh, throughout the audience. Uh, you, can, you can turn them in down to the right side there, and they'll be screened and come back to us, and uh, if, hopefully we'll have time to, uh, to address some of those. So uh, I'd like to introduce my, myself, I'm John Ward. I'm from the uh, Rockland Democratic Town Committee. And to my right is Anthony or Tony Garfield from the Republican Town Committee. Uh, this event is being sponsored by both organizations. And so, let's see, go a little further, who I see? A lot of happy faces. So, thank you all for coming here this evening, and thank you for the, uh, the uh, audience who's going to tune into this later on. Uh, at this point, I would like to introduce our candidates. We have uh, State Representative David DeCoste. <laughs> and we have Norwell Selectman Allison DeMond. <laughs> and uh, at this time, I'd like to ask uh, David DeCoste for his opening statement. Okay. Thank you, John. And thanks to both town committees of, uh, I guess, all three towns for sponsoring this, along with the Rockland Public Schools for providing the venue and WRPS for recording and broadcasting. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Dave DeCoast, and I've been your leg rep legislative representative for the last four years. Now, just by way of background, I was born and raised here. I grew up in Norwell, K through 12. I worked my way through schools, earning degrees in accounting and finance from Northeastern University and later a graduate degree in financial economics from Boston University. I served 29 years in the Army, and I retired as a major and came home to work with some family businesses, more specifically to Rockland. And over the past four years, working with Governor Baker and the legislature, I'm happy to report that we have followed through on our promises to fully fund local aid at the highest level that we have ever. I have been fortunate to work locally with terrific public office holders to support legislation, make it, making it tougher on drug dealers, easier on veterans, and more attractive for business people to own and operate a business in this community. I have specifically led the fight for better conditions for foster care providers with the help of Rockland resident Barbara Papil, I should mention, against tolls on Route 3 for increasing local aid to our schools and for sensible housing and water quality po policies. And as Rockland State Representative, I made it a point to work with elected officials like school committee member Chair Dan Biggins, Selectman Larry Ryan and Michael Laughlin, tax collector Judy Hardigan, former South Shore Votech board member Jerry Blake, former veteran service agent Tony Materner, and moderator Kevin Henderson to address issues that impact both specific residents and the town of, as a whole. And I should add, I'm glad to have the endorsement of, for re-election from every one of those individuals. And I ask you to, endor to, to vote for me, to go back to the legislature and represent you on November 6th. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, thank you, Jack and Tony and everyone for having us here tonight for this wonderful venue. Um, for those I have not yet met, my name is Allison DeMang. I am a selectman in the town of Norwell. 
I've lived there for 17 years uh, with my husband, Ned, and our two children, Jack, aged 15, and Evie, aged 12, who both attend uh, the Norwell Public Schools. Um, my professional background is environmental management and planning, and I have worked for the State Office of Coastal Zone Management and also locally for the North and South Rivers Watershed Association. Um, I've served on both elected and appointed boards in Norwell for 13 years, and I really enjoy being a part of local government. So I'm running for state representative because our district is underserved, and I know from being a selectman that we are missing opportunities because we do not have a strong voice advocating for our needs on Beacon Hill. And we all pay state tax dollars, but right now those dollars are going to other districts to address their priorities. So if I'm elected your state representative, I will be forward thinking when it comes to economic development, pushing the state for more investment in our downtowns and our buildings, our roadways and sidewalks. I will be a fighter when it comes to the opioid crisis, bringing passion and energy to find new solutions to this problem that's devastating our district and specifically Rockland. And I will also push the, school, uh, push the state for more public school funding um, so that we can lessen the burden on our local property taxes. But equally important, I will be an advocate for you. I will be your link to state government and I will be an accessible advocate um, for you. I am always around. If you call me, I will call you back and I can be counted on to get results. Uh, I think in this day and age with so much division in our country right now, we need to elect more leaders who are able to listen to one another, work together and solve our common problems. And I am that kind of leader and I ask for your vote on November 6th. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. DeMong. We will now go to the question and answer session. Uh, the first question has to do with gun control. It's an issue both statewide and national, but especially at the statewide level because the laws change from state to state. Uh, what we'd like to know is basically what is each candidate's opinion on gun control and do they feel that we should have, we need more, less, or the same as far as gun control? And we can start with a nice lady candidate over there, okay. Alison DeMond. Thank you. Um, yes, I feel fortunate to live in a state that has strong gun laws on the books. Uh, Massachusetts, for instance, is only one of five states um, where the um, local police chiefs have the authority to deny um, someone in the community a, um, an application for a firearm. And um, it's, it's laws like that that um, contribute to the fact that Massachusetts has the lowest number of gun deaths in the country. And so, um, you know, just this past summer, um, Charlie Baker and the legislature voted to enact the red flag gun law, which I was disappointed to see that our current representative voted against. Um, with a minority of other uh, legislators. Um, but this, this law did pass, and um, as Charlie Baker said, you know, we've made so much progress, but when there's more to do, we do it. And so this law passed, and it would um, temporarily remove guns from those who are considered a threat to themselves or others. And um, so I think that Massachusetts is on the right track. We are um, passing good, strong gun laws that keep, our, um, keep gun violence in check. Uh, while protecting the Second Amendment. So um, I would absolutely um, support those, those laws we have in the books. Oh, my. <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> every time. Do you want to answer the same question? I'd be same, delighted same to. Same question for Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Representative DeCoste. Uh, Massachusetts is, is among the highest regulated state uh, in the union in terms of gun control laws. In some, in some ways, we do things intelligently, but they never get applied. Bartley Fox is an example of that. Back in 1978, we passed Bartley Fox, and it's never once been applied to, and this is the law that should be applied if you are caught carrying a gun without a license, and yet we have never applied it. It's been it's constantly pleaded down. So part of the problem with the gun laws are um, have to do with they're simply not enforced, and um, they should be. Uh, the second part, uh, in some cases, laws are unwise, and I will give you, as regard the ERPA bill specifically, uh, I have been working on a number of, with women advocate groups, as, as a matter of fact, uh, on laws that would make non-lethal means of defense uh, easily purchasable over the counter. The law that you referenced uh, would now make it uh, not, not uh, applicable in terms of uh, being able to be purchased, 
and now per people who want a non-lethal means of defense, those people typically are younger and older women who are not capable or, or comfortable, comfortable, I should say, having a firearm in the house, now have to go through a training regimen, which, by the way, hasn't been, hasn't been designed. So right now, for somebody who wants a non-lethal means of defense, they have to go out of state to one of the 30 states, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine, uh, three of them, that, uh, that uh, allow them to be purchased over the counter. So I believe in sensible gun laws. I don't believe in laws that restrict, uh, restrict the Second Amendment in terms of the rights of individuals to defend themselves. And I certainly don't uh, support legislation that makes it tougher to have non-lethal means of uh, self-defense. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Next question is in regard to school safety. Do we need armed guards, and what about arming teachers? Ms. DeMond. Um, I think there are a lot more effective ways to promote school safety than introducing more guns into our schools. Um, I have a teenager. Um, high schools can be volatile, emotional places, and I think that the presence of more guns is a recipe for disaster. So um, I don't know of any teachers that think this is a good idea. Um, I'm certainly not in favor of this. And I think that uh, we're better off working with our local police departments, our superintendents, um, working on you know, additional um, safety protocols and, um, and other ways to, to keep our kids safe. But I don't think guns is the answer. Thank you. No. So I, I <laughs> Mr. Coast. Yeah, to, to answer your question, I, I I've never heard anyone advocate that in the state. Certainly none of the three, three superintendents or the school committee members, nor has any citizen within the three towns ever advocated that, so I, I would say no. Um, to use the rest of my time, I'll give you an example where uh, at least outlining and delineating better laws to have uh, more armed police officers on and off duty and retired uh, is important to do is, is a law that I have sponsored at the behest of the Corrections Officers Association. It uh, basically aligns the Law Enforcement Officer Safety Act to apply to local corrections officers, and this is a federal act, which allows retired officers who often in the course of a 30-year, 20-year career make quite a few enemies, it allows them to simply carry there with the permission and in coordination with the local police chiefs at, allows uh, retired police officers uh, to carry their sidearms. Uh, that's the type of legislation I would support. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I got a technical malfunction. I'm sorry, you're, you've got the next one. Okay, um, the next question has to deal with a, a major problem that's across the country, across the state, especially hot hit in Rockland. As I look around the audience, I see individuals here that have either lost someone to op opioids or know of someone who's lost to opioids. Uh, just last year alone, I think there's been at least seven deaths here in the town of Rockland from the op opioid crisis. Luckily, we live in a state in Massachusetts that does focus on the opioid crisis. We're the first ones in the, in the country to do that. Therefore, the question I will ask is, uh, what would you, as a state representative, propose to com combat uh, drug abuse and especially the op opioid crisis? We'll start with um, uh, Selectman uh, Allison DeMong. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. And um, the opioid crisis needs to be a top priority for this um, our, our state representative. And um, I don't think we're going to um, incarcerate our way out of this problem. It's very complex, and it requires a myriad of various solutions. Um, I, I think that you know we need to work closely with um, the first responders and local advocacy groups like Rockland Cares, um, since they're on the front lines and they're um, closest to the to the problem, and they'll have more of the solutions that we need to be to be working very closely with them. Um, for instance, in August, the Boston Globe had an article about how um, people who work in the trades, and specifically construction, were six times as likely to um, become addicted uh, and die from opioid overdose. And that's really powerful information that should drive policy. Um, and, um, and I know Rockland Cares was already aware of that. So 
Um, I think that this is you know, a top priority. I have the passion and, um, and energy to really jump in and, and address this issue. Another issue is um, mental health. You know, just uh, new research showing that Massachusetts residents um, are not having access to or not able to afford mental health. Well, that's really tied into the opioid crisis. I mean, that leads to addiction for people who start to self-medicate. So it's really um, a multifaceted problem, and um, I think we just need some new ideas and some, some new energy, and um, I really want to get to work on that. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Representative DeCoast? Um, the opioid problem and uh, drug abuse in general, two-pronged two -pronged solution. Um, one has to do with getting users to treatment. And Rockland, by the way, has some people who really, who really step out and lead that. I won't, uh, I won't get into it, but there are some folks here in this town who do a terrific job, whether it's monitoring, uh, monitoring detox beds on Facebook or locally with me, we're able to find treatment and so forth. It, uh, we really do a terrific job locally here. Um, within the region, I've sponsored, and we just finished up last night, a third forum on opioids. And um, the district attorney was there as was a representative of the sheriff's office. And I should say, I, in both of those cases, I'm glad to have their, re their endorsement for re-election. Uh, but they, they pointed out correctly that uh, while treatment is important, we also need to go over and uh, greatly enhance punishment for drug traffickers. Now, personally, I, I, would, I would treat drug traffickers uh, as harshly as we could pr practically treat them. And just as importantly, move those traffickers who don't belong in their country immediately, once they're out of prison, out of the country, and back to where they belong. We don't always do that now, and we need to get better doing that. But overall, in a minute, to answer your question, um, we have a problems with, uh, in terms of regulating opioids, in terms of providing beds and for treatment, and also for punishment. I think we're getting better. Uh, in all facets, and I'm glad to work with Governor Baker. Uh, we passed a terrific jo uh, law uh, last session that basically delineated uh, punishments for trafficking in uh, fentanyl and carfentanyl, and um, we hope this year uh, to make even tougher laws for those individuals. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next question. The Town of Rockland's been looking at uh, a new fire department and possibly a, a new elementary school. Uh, question is, should state aid be increased to the cities and towns? Ms. DeMar. Um, yes. Uh, sure, sorry, of course. Um, yes, of course, state aid should be um, increased to the cities and towns. Uh, cities and towns have so many needs, as we know. Um, being a selectman, I'm familiar with our our local budget, and there's a lot of um, needs that we have, whether it's capital improvements, um, programming, um, obviously our public schools. So um, to get the state to pay an increase, um, more local aid can help with all those areas, but specifically with, with public schools. Um, I think that Chapter 70, and which is the formula, um, or the foundation formula, that the state provides money to the municipalities for public education is very outdated and it needs to be revisited. And um, once the, the state needs to increase its share of public education, which would in, in therefore allow other municipal priorities to be funded. Um, you know, on that note, uh, we just need a strong advocate who's willing to fight for us. Um, in, in terms of, in addition to local aid, one way that money comes back to the district is from your state representative and your state senator um, fighting to add increases for certain programs and projects in the governor's budget. And um, we just have been not getting that money back to our district while other South Shore towns have been getting you know, about a, over a million dollars over the past four years, and unfortunately, we've only seen about $115,000 um, in coming back to our district. So um, I think that there's other ways to fund these priorities. Um, one is through local aid, and one is through special projects. Thank you, Mr. Mon. <laughs> Mr. DeCoast. Well, two-pronged question, really. Chapter 70 is, is delineated by a formula. So, folks, if you, if you want to change that formula, I can tell you that there's one party that is working aggressively, and every member of that party is working towards changing that formula. It's the party I belong to. 
I agree with you that uh, when you're dealing with the governor, it is good to, uh, to have an advocacy. And I sit with the governor every month and advocate. It's something you won't be able to do. And I've done that for four years. And we've been able to get funding for schools here. We've been able to get direct funding for DCR trails. We've been able to get, uh, for the Polymer Corporation, one of many examples where we have a workforce granting. We've been able to get uh, workforce grants for Zildjian Symbols. We've been able to get millions of dollars on the way to clean up Hanover's waste site, the fireworks site, which I can tell you is probably a, as much a concern in, regionally as anything because, the, because of the toxicity they're pulling out of there. So in terms of, the, uh, in terms of replacing the fire station and schools and so forth, yes, the Chapter 70 formula needs to be reworked. But folks, just, there's one party that's going to rework that in conjunction with the governor. The only, the only holdup to that is on the other side. And I don't mean to make it partisan, but it is that simple. Um, and, uh, you know, towards that end, we will continue to work with the governor to get as much state, state aid as we possibly can, either through, through increasing Chapter 70 grants or through uh, special grants, whether it be the small bridges uh, and roads, Chapter 90, et cetera. All right, thank you. Um, we will uh, try. We have a number of questions we want to fit in, so we, want to, uh, we will uh, advise you when your time is running out. Sure. Uh, next question. Uh, the next question is, is a, a, a question that's been on the ballot, and it's been um, circulated a lot. Uh, it has to do with marijuana, and right now every city and town is facing marijuana zones uh, coming into their towns. Uh, but there's still a question whether legalized marijuana is a good or bad idea. Do, do, does either candidate have an opinion on this? We'll start with um, Mr. Mong. Um, sure. I mean, I, I'm very, very much in favor of medical marijuana. Um, I, I have a very close friend whose son has severe epilepsy, and it's been life-changing for them. And I think that there are new um, applications for medical marijuana that we're learning more and more about. And in fact, I think it should be part of the conversation about the opioid crisis because it can be used for very effectively for pain management and is not addictive. So um, I'm very much in favor of medical marijuana. Recreational marijuana is a different ball of wax, and um, our three towns have chosen how to deal with that differently, um, which is fine. I just uh, personally, all, all I care about is that the cities and towns have the local control um, to implement the programs how or implement this industry how they want in their town. So I know Rockland is inviting recreational to come in, and I just want to make sure that um, Rockland is able to negotiate a good host agreement, um, community agreement, to make sure that they're getting the revenues that they are expecting. Um, so I don't, whether it's good or bad, it's here. Um, it is. It, it's, it's happening, and um, I just want it to be a positive um, addition to our communities and also a, a revenue generator. Thank you. And uh, Representative Coast. Well, the medical marijuana, again, two different issues. Mer medical marijuana will be established and it will be implemented. I'd like to see it further regulated. Personally, I'd like to see it go through pharmacists, but certainly uh, we now have the ability to grow marijuana, uh, six pence per, per adult, as I understand it, up to a total of 12. Um, and um, there will be some facilities here. If you look to what's going on in Colorado, it is, it is not all positive. Uh, individuals who rely on licensed tradespeople, uh, whether they be CDL drivers, uh, whether they be folks who are uh, using hoisting licenses, um, whether they be any individual basically required to be sober, are having a tougher and tougher time finding people who are not using this. Um, so I'm not a big fan of recreational marijuana. I voted against it. Every single police uh, official in all three towns, the district attorney, every one of them, see my police chief in, in Norwell, I, I don't want to speak for Chief Llewellyn, Chief Sweeney, but I asked every one of them. Every one said they believed to some extent recreational ma marijuana was a gateway drug to heroin, and I believe that. The experts I had there last night in Hanover at the Opioid Forum said it was a gateway drug to heroin for about 8 to 12 percent of the population. I don't think this is going to turn out well. Um, 
Next question. Should there be tolls charged uh, with, say, scanners or easy passes for driving on Route 3? Ms. DeMond. <laughs> Um, no, I think this is a non-starter. Um, you know, transportation issues is a major problem throughout the state and obviously in the South Shore. Um, but we need to take regional approach and find regional solutions. Um, you know, my husband does commute to Boston and um, we've all commuted to Boston and we know that it needs to be addressed. Um, I just, I, I don't know what's happening. I, I, I've asked around and I don't hear much movement from ex people who are currently uh, serving in our legislature, but I think this is a topic that needs to be tackled. And um, I just, however it's addressed, I think that we need to be very mindful of the communities. If we talk about anything happening on Route 3, we just need to be really mindful of the communities that abut uh, Route 3 so that they are not negatively impacted um, by any future development. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. DePost. Well, John, you, you probably know when that was proposed, uh, I led the fight. As a matter of fact, I was the first one with Citizens for Limited Taxation to oppose tolls on Route 3, to oppose tolls on Route 93 and 95. Their plan was going to tax you every time you went to the city. It could be at 6 a.m. on a Sunday morning, but you were going to pay a tax going in and going out. Uh, I led the fight against that. So no, uh, you can guarantee I'm not going to vote for that tax increase or for any other tax increase. I think the people of Massachusetts are taxed enough. And there's a very interesting Reason, Reason Magazine study that looked at the, uh, the amount of uh, road spending we do. And, and we do quite a bit, and it's extremely inefficient. It's extremely inefficient even compared to states like Rhode Island and New Jersey. We don't do well doing that. Okay? okay thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next question uh, has to do with uh, Route 3. Uh, should a lane be added from South Weymouth to Duxbury? And as part of that project, should we rebuild the Braintree split? We'll start with uh, uh, Mr. Monk, please. Um, I mean, I, 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 I don't know. <laughs> um, I think that that's something that needs to be addressed and looked at. We all know that Route 3 traffic is terrible and there needs to be something done. I guess I go back to my previous answer that if anything is done like a widening, that it's just um, there's good solid communication with all the neighborhoods that um, abut those, that road um, because the, those neighbors will be impacted and need to be um, aware and included in the conversation so that um, mitigation can uh, take place if need be. My understanding, my understanding of the Route 3 and, and the Braintree split problem is, is that's the bottleneck, that you can't do much there. Um, so I, there was actually a department of uh, Mass Dot was actually briefing Hingham, in Hingham around 2015 about a plan to do just that, and Governor Biker put an end to it. And I don't think it's going to be, uh, I don't think it's going to be revived. Um, let me talk generally about something positive that we're, we are doing for transportation in this region. Um, and it has to do with dredging out uh, the harbors and the areas in Hull and Hingham to allow more ferry traffic. We are doing, as a matter of fact, I am working specifically with Representative Moschino of Hull and Hingham to support, uh, support more dredging in those areas. Does it affect my district? in terms of spending within the district? No, but it certainly allows everyone here to drive over to Hull and Hingham, and we're going to have a great, I think that the traffic in terms of supporting the ferries are going to go, is, is going to increase greatly over the next 10 years because of what we're doing in terms of uh, parking and uh, facilities, okay? There's a positive piece of news. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me, next question. Should medical insurance companies be required to cover pre-existing conditions? Ms. DeMont. Um, yes, absolutely. And I, you know, Massachusetts has always been a leader in public health and we need to continue to lead on this. Um, I know that, you know, Mass Health does cover pre-existing conditions and I just think it's unconscionable for insurance companies to not insure people when they need it most. So um, I think that, um, you know, most people in this room probably have a pre-existing condition. So we need, to, we need to be protecting people and making sure that they are getting the health benefits they need, especially when they need them both. So I would like to see, um, like to see that be legislated about and ensure those benefits. 
Thank you. Same question, Mr. DeCoste. Yeah, it, we, uh, we do that now, and I don't think it's going to change. So yes, I think pre-existing uh, conditions will always be covered. Um, what we need to do in terms of uh, math, mass health is an interesting, it's an interesting situation. One way that, uh, and the Baker administration is moving forward of this, and, and I support them 100%. Um, one way that we are doing a little bit better in terms of controlling costs, although it is increasing greatly, is to move some of the people who don't belong on Mass Health off. And I'll give you one example specifically along the border states, and this happens with schools as well, that we get a great number of people from Rhode Island and Connecticut and New Hampshire and Haverhill and Plainville and Rentham and so forth, Springfield, who are getting onto Mass Health, claiming residency in, the United, in, in Massachusetts, but actually living in other states. So we're doing a little bit better job uh, de uh, uh, detecting those people and moving them off the system. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The next question has to deal with campaign finance. It's uh, what are the sources of funds that are being utilized uh, for your specific campaign? We'll start with um, uh, Ms. Demong, please. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm really pleased to say that as of today, I have over 250 individual donors to um, my campaign. So really proud of that and really honored and humbled by the amount of support that I've um, received throughout this campaign, um, throughout the district, including well, all three towns. And um, I have received the endorsement and financial contributions from many uh, labor organizations um, who know that I share their values of um, equality and um, um, economic stability. And um, other than that, that's the, that's the total, some, some total. Um, um, you know, Representative DeCosta has had several mailers paid for by the state Republican Party, but I have, um, all of mine have been funded by my donors. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Representative DeCosta, same question, well, state, please. We do go through the state Republican Party, but that's mm -hmm. actually, I write them a check. Um, I, for instance, don't have $5,000 from out of state like you. I don't have any money from out of state. As a matter, you know, they're individual donors, yep. and you kind of wonder why people from Washington State and New York That's State and Vermont <laughs> Those are, my in -laws. are well, <laughs> contributing to you. Um, I have raised virtually all my funds, individual donors within Rockland, Hanover, Norwell, and we do have some organizations that have uh, uh, supported us in terms of police organization, the laborers union, a number of police organizations and so forth. But um, we do what we always do. We, we uh, uh, collect within the area. That's right. Okay. You want to give her 30 seconds to rebut? Would you like to uh, rebut? I, uh, no, I just, no? the people in Washington are, and Vermont are my family. So. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, next question. I, I would, ladies and gentlemen, ask if you would hold your applause. Uh, we're getting pressed for time and want to get through as many of these as we can. Uh, do you support free tuition for Commonwealth residents attending Massachusetts community colleges? This is Ms. DeMong, excuse me. Um, well, having two kids in the public school system right now, uh, the, the looming college on the horizon is terrifying uh, financially. So of course, on, first, on the face of it, it sounds like a great idea um, to have free tuition for community colleges, but um, I just don't know how we would pay for that. So I can't give a good answer on that. At this point, um, you know, something would have to be cut um, in the state budget, and I don't know what that would be. So um, I, don't, I don't have enough information to answer that. As much as it sounds like a great idea, it sounds very expensive. Thank you. Mr. DeMong. Excuse me, Mr. DeCoste. <laughs> Um, well, two, two questions back to you. When I, you say resident, I assume you mean legal resident. So folks who are legally here That's in good. the Commonwealth who are Massachusetts residents. Yes, I support generally. And, and when you look at, I, I will put in a plug for the community co college system. Um, they are very liberal in terms of giving out grants. So why, and it's an excellent system. Uh, the gentleman, the, the wealthiest member of my family uh, started off with two years of community college and went on to Bentley and uh, is a managing partner with, with a big F4 accounting firm. And he does very well. They do a great job. And um, to the extent that we can do it, if you're a millionaire, you, maybe your children shouldn't get free tuition at community college. But uh, I think that uh, they do a very good job identifying needs, supporting needs. And I will put in one more plug for the Mass Air and uh, Army National Guard. 
Uh, if you join the National Guard, you get free tuition, and we're working on free, uh, uh, free, free fees. In other words, your entire freight will be covered for the first two years. And I certainly support something like that. The BRAVE Act, which we passed, actually goes, goes a little bit towards doing that. Okay? Thank you. Okay, the next question has to do with climate change. Um, what kind of regulations would you support uh, as a state representative in climate change with the Mass Legislature? Um, we'll start with uh, Mrs. DeMong. Um, I'm, I'm glad you brought up climate change because at our forum last week, um, I, I thought Representative DeCoast in, insinuated that he does not believe that climate change is real, so I'd love some clarification on that. Um, I, climate change is real. It's happening now. Um, we all need to get on the same page with this, um, and we need to address and enact policies that um, can reduce our carbon footprint. Um, keeping environmental regulations in place and um, enforcing them is critical to not only protecting you know, bugs and the bunnies, as an environmental type person might say, but also just our collective public health. Um, so we need, this is important stuff, and um, it's critical that we all get on board. Um, you know, as a legislator, the state government is likely the largest user of energy. Um, and just like in our towns, the municipal, the municipal buildings are our biggest um, user of energy. So I think um, instituting more um, programs like the Green Communities uh, program that the state has, which is an incentive for towns to invest in um, you know, solar panels and LED lights and, and trying to make their buildings more energy efficient um, is a really wonderful program that can bring down our carbon use, but also reduce our energy costs um, for the town. So I'd be interested in also uh, raising um, or eliminating the cap on um, solar net metering, which would really boost um, investment in that industry. And um, I don't know, I just uh, think that we need to be vigilant about it and we need to come up with creative solutions. So uh, this is important, thank you. Um, the question you referred to had to do with the United Nations and I was not particularly enamored of the United Nations given the United States direction. Um, so that's why I answered that way. There's, there's no doubt there's climate change going on. Uh, a good individual that I reference uh, on YouTube is uh, Dr. Lenz, who is the climate head climatologist at MIT. He talks all about it. There's no, no doubt that the climate is changing, and it always has been changing. We go from ice ages uh, to the ages that we have now, and, and so forth and so on. Um, I'm not sure how much the state the state uh, does have a climate change committee. I haven't been on it, and I'm not sure they've accomplished a whole lot. Um, but let me give you one concrete example of good things that we are doing in terms of energy and renewable energy that uh, Governor Baker is proposing, and I fully support 100%, and that is uh, bringing in hydropower from Canada. Hydropower from Canada is inexhaustible. It is totally green, and we have the ability, and I believe the, uh, the almost responsibility to bring that power down um, from the Canadian provinces, whether, and there are a number of competing, there are three actual, three actual proposals to do that. So that's one example of things we can do too, and I think that's what you are getting at, to make, uh, to make our energy sources cleaner. Great, so we just go with one? We're going to ask the same question of both candidates. Um, uh, why are you the, uh, we'll start with Mrs. DeMond, why are you the best candidate for this position? Well, I believe I have the experience and the leadership skills and the communication skills to be the better candidate for this role. Um, I ha can bring the energy and the passion that we've been lacking in this, um, in this role for several years now. Um, I've shown from being a selectman um, that I can be effective, I can work with just about anyone, and um, I can be counted on to get results. So um, when I'm passionate about something, I'm gonna run with it, and I'll stick with it until the job gets done. And um, uh, if, if you vote for me, you will have a voice at the State House that um, you will always be able to reach out, and I will work with you and be your partner um, to help achieve the goals of this district. Thank you. Same question for Representative DeCoste. Well, we could go into more, and I've got 60 seconds to do it, but I, I, I will just simply put to the people who, who have endorsed me into, in, your, in your town, two of your sitting selectmen out of the three remaining, the chair of your school committee, among others, 
I've got members of the Finance Committee I didn't reference who are endorsing me, and they see results. So the, the mantra that I'm, that I'm not getting results is, is rebutted by the people I work with that work for you that you elected every day who have endorsed me. We have gotten results specifically for schools. We've got results for trails. We've got results in terms of uh, corporations within the community who are expanding as a result of, uh, of uh, workforce, uh, workforce grants. And I could give you a plethora of other examples. In terms, and I will talk about accessibility. I don't know of a single legislature, legislator among the 160 that commits every Friday to being in the district. And I see a lot of faces that I see in town hall on a regular, on a regular basis. I am here. I have my cell phone. Every town clerk and every, every, every town clerk and every selectman secretary have my cell phone number that I've told them to give out, and they do it all the time in terms of getting hold of me. I don't think you'll find that very often in many other, many other legislatures, either senators or, or representatives. Thank you. Okay? Um, but let's uh, move to closing statements at this po point in time. Um, Ms. DeMond. I just want to say thank you to everyone. Thank you guys for hosting this tonight. Thank you for everyone for coming here and listening to us. Um, just real simply, I am really excited about the future of our district. And in particular, I'm really excited about Rockland. Um, you know, as, a, as someone with a planning background, um, I've been learning about what's going on with Reimagine Rockland and meeting with your town administrator or acting town administrator and your selectmen, your school committee members and everyone and learning about all the opportunity that is to, that's happening in this town right now. And um, I'm just really excited about it. I want to be your partner. I want to work with you. I want to be your advocate. Um, Representative DeCoast has named several things that have happened. We can do so much more. I look at what other districts are getting and what they're doing, and that's the kind of legislator I want to be. So I ask for your support, and I ask for your vote on November 6th. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mong. Mr. DeCoast. Again, I would like to thank uh, all the town committees, WRPFs and the, the Rockland School System for making the venue, uh, venue available. I will just reiterate uh, that it's been a pleasure being your state representative. And I think what would recommend me to be reelected is the fact that I simply do represent you. I represent the folks who are getting up every morning and go to work. And when I hear that taxes are going to be raised, you can guarantee that I will be uh, opposing them. When I hear candidates dismissing entire law enforcement professions as racist, you can guarantee, number one, that I'm never going to support them, and number two, that I will work with candidates who will support the police and respect the police, which is probably why, among the two of us, I have the endorsement of every major police organization in the state who have endorsed people. I will continue to work with your elected representatives because it's not my job to determine what Rockland needs to do. It's Rockland coming to me, telling me, this is what we've decided, and or what can we do to help them? And in terms of bringing people in, we have, uh, as a matter of fact, we have the, the town, the, the state actuary coming in in a couple of weeks, I think, to talk about the actuarial situation. I have regularly talked to all of your selectmen, the school committee, and uh, to, to get down into the weeds, actually, we regularly go out with the superintendents and talk to them in terms of specifically what they need, and those are what become the earmarks for my budget earmarks, all schools. So in terms of accessibility, reliability, uh, and dedication to, this is a job, not as a, I, I should have mentioned, I am not going to take a pension, I am not going to take a pay raise, I, re, I re reimburse that all to the town, and I will continue to do that, and I will also continue to vigorously uh, involve myself in local civic organizations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, at this time, ladies and gentlemen, I, if you would thank uh, Allison DeMong and David DeCoast for being here tonight at this forum. Thank you very much. We're going to take a short break so we can set up for the selectmen portion of the event. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, once again, for coming to part two of uh, Candidates Night, uh, October 2018.
I just want to go over a few ground rules for everybody. Uh, each candidate will have up to two minutes for an opening statement. We will go to a question and answer period. Uh, questions that can be answered up to one minute. And there will be a 30 second rebuttal if necessary. We will then go to uh, closing statements of up to two minutes. Um, if you have any questions, there, there will be no questions, verbal questions from the audience or verbal statements from the audience. If you do have any questions, hopefully you've already submitted them to our question screeners over in the corner, or Lou Valenzola and Jean Berglou. And uh, with that, I want to uh, thank the, the following individuals who have joined us tonight as candidates for the Board of Selectmen. Uh, that's uh, Richard Penny, Brian Kane, um, Jared Valenzola, Jim Simpson, and Karen Nyman. So thank you for stepping up and running for a selectman. I would ask the audience as we go through this to hold your applause so that we can get through all the, as many questions as we can. And with that, I will have Tony Gawke from the Republican Town Committee start off. Okay, the first question is to, we'll start down the line, all the way down, uh, from uh, left to right, okay? Uh, what do you do for a living, first of all, and what experience do you have that will assist the Board of Selectmen and help the town? Start with the end, please. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, oh, no, I'm, so I'm sorry. Yeah, we jumped the gun. Correct. Okay. Opening statements, Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. <laughs> Good evening, um, I'm Jim Simpson. Um, just a little bit about me real quick uh, for the two minutes we have is um, I'm a lifelong resident of Rockland. Um, I've made my career here in the town of Rockland. Um, I've been married for 10 years. I met my wife, Shayla, here in the town of Rockland. Um, I was a class of 90 out of Rockland High School. I played sports from youth all the way up. Um, I have three children who are, um, <clears throat> my son is in seventh grade at the middle school. Um, he's an honor student and also an athlete. Uh, my daughters attend the Jefferson School. Um, they're in uh, fourth and third grade, and they're excelling in their academics, and they're also uh, young athletes with the town, with the junior youth program. Uh, basically, um, I just want to be involved in my community. I have been um, since I graduated high school. Um, I've created my uh, career here. Um, I'm out in the community every day, and um, I just want to continue to support my community and hopefully um, do some positive work towards the problems that we have in front of us. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Uh, next, Mr. Valenzuela. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you so much for, uh, for uh, your opening statement, for being here tonight, and for your service to our country and our community. Um, it's great to have you uh, in this race, as well as uh, my other opponents. My name is Jared Valenzuela, and I'm running for the one-year, five-month term on the Rockland Board of Selectmen. Thank you to the Republican and Democrat town committees for putting this evening together and to WRPS for recording it for a later broadcast. Uh, myself, I am also a lifelong resident of Rockland, recently purchased my home here to set my roots down probably for the rest of my life. Uh, I'm uniquely positioned and experienced to be elected to the Rockland Board of Selectmen and hit the ground running. I'm currently the clerk of the Rockland Planning Board, a position I've held for three years. Previously, I served on the Rockland School Building Committee, uh, on the committee that was responsible for the room that we're sitting in right this very moment. I'm also on the Elementary School Building Committee, serving uh, in that capacity, and I formerly was the chairman of the Charter Committee. Uh, I'm also the Grand Knight of the Rockland Knights of Columbus, and I believe that experience leading, our, uh, leading a nonprofit in this community uh, unique, uniquely positions me uh, to be able to hit the ground running on the Rockland Board of Selectmen, as well as the Lions Club and the Rockland Fraternal Order of Eagles. Uh, like many of you in this room and elsewhere, I think many folks were upset by some of the transgressions of this past summer. And who better to be elected to the Board of Selectmen to lead Rockland out of that quagmire than someone who themselves has made mistakes, grown from mistakes, and learned from them. To err is to human, to forgive is divine. And I firmly believe that I am uniquely positioned to serve each and every one of you, both at home and in this crowd, on the Rockland Board of Selectmen. I respectfully ask for your vote on November 6th. And again, my name is Jared Valenzuela, and I'm running for the one-year, five-month term on the Rockland Board of Selectmen. Thank you, Mr. Valenzuela. <clears throat> Ms. Nyman. My name is Karen Iman, and I'm running to be your next selectman. Nearly two years ago, after an incredibly hard-fought campaign for state representative, I promised you that I would remain active and involved in civic life throughout the district. Today, I'm proud to say that I've done just that. 
I have continued to express my overwhelming passion for public service through volunteer committees and community activities. Furthermore, in 2017, I was elected to serve on the Hanover Planning Board. As I hope you've learned from me before, I have a strong passion for public service and helping others. In college, I earned a bachelor's degree in government, and I recently completed my master's degree in public administration from Suffolk University. I also have seven years of experience working in state government, learning about and working on the important issues we all face every day. Last year, I was fortunate enough to be able to buy my own house in a community that so many of my family grew up in and a community that I love, Rockland. Over the past few months, the town has faced some trying times. During these times, neighbors and community leaders have encouraged me to consider running for the Rockland Board of Selectmen. Tonight, I'm thrilled to be here as a candidate for the one and a half year seat on the Rockland Board of Selectmen. I am running for Selectmen because I care about the people of this town and I want to make a difference. I've been drawn to public service my entire life and believe strongly in the importance of giving back to the community. I am very fortunate to have had not one, but two parents who have shown me how a public servant can make a difference in one's life. I also have the real life experiences and education to understanding so many of the problems we face. I know that I have the energy, passion, and motivation to make a difference. I want to focus on issues that matter, like supporting projects for a new elementary school and a fire station, revitalizing our downtown, and being an advocate for our veterans, seniors, and public safety personnel. These are just few of the issues that I care deeply about. I hope you are able to learn more about me and my ideas tonight, and I hope to earn your vote for selectmen on November 6th. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nyman. Mr. Pennings. Thank you to both the Democratic and Republic committees, uh, Dave and Seth and uh, RPS, and uh, everyone here tonight. Uh, thank you very much for coming out and for those listening at home. My name is Richard Penny. I'm running for the five-month term of selectmen. I've been born and raised in Rockland. Uh, went to the Rockland school systems, graduated in 1982, attended uh, Southeastern Mass University, what is today UMass Dartmouth. Uh, I'm currently a... Uh, Director of Sales for Johnson Lancaster, and um, been married to my wife for 27 years. Uh, we uh, chose Rockland uh, to uh, to build a house and to raise our kids. We've got a daughter, Kara, 21 years old, graduated from the school system, currently attends Westfield State as a uh, as a senior. My son, Chris, uh, just a recent graduate, he is a freshman at Bryant University. Uh, I really became involved in the town about 15 years ago. Uh, first coaching sports, I've coached soccer, basketball, uh, girls um, softball, uh, Little League. I actually was on the board, uh, Rockland Basketball, uh, for over 10 years, uh, with uh, seven of those years as president. Been a member of the finance committee for 10 years that I recently had to resign to actually run for this, uh, for this spot. It was a very tough decision to do. Uh, was on the school building committee for the high school and middle school. So the building you sit in today, I was part of bringing to fruition. Uh, also currently right now, I sit as chairman on the school building committee for the new elementary school. Question I've been asked the most, <laughs> why run? It's, uh, it's a good question. Uh, the simple answer is because I feel it's the right thing to do. Um, I feel I can bring a sense of order and stability to what's been a rocky road help lead a process to replace key positions within the town, uh, within the town um, and both lend a short-term and long-term vision. My professional and civic positions provide me with knowledge and experience that my opponent just does not have. I've hired more than 150 individuals in my career um, in senior management. It includes uh, in directors and regional positions. I've, uh, I've been a member of the Finance Committee for 10 years, and I think those things in particular uh, position me well for the selectmen. I will be visible, I'll be approachable, and I'll always be looking out for the best interests of the town and most importantly, the residents. Thank you. Thank you Mr. Penny. Mr. Kane. Thank you and good evening. Uh, and thank you to the uh, Democratic and Republican Committee along with Rockland High School and WRPS for your hospitality and the opportunity to participate in this evening's event. My name is Brian Leo Kane. Um, I am the proud father of three grown adults in their 30s and two grandchildren, Adele, who just turned, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, nine years old, and Joshua, whose birthday is today, he turned seven. Happy birthday, Josh. 
All righty, all right. Um, as a former elected town meeting member and chairman of the South Suburban uh, member in Weymouth, I am a transplant. Uh, chose to move here for a quieter, simpler life and pulled out papers to run for selectmen. Go figure. Um, so, um, as a, as a former town elected town meeting member and board ch chairman of the South Suburban Affordable Housing, um, which I am, uh, the, as I said, the chairman managing f a four and a half million dollar uh, housing complex right on the Abington Weymouth line. Um, I've also served two terms as vice chairman of the Weymouth Republican Town Committee. I've been a dele uh, elected delegate to the Republican State Convention and served on the steering committee for the late Mayor Menino's Office of Cultural Affairs in support of initiatives of the Long Ca Log Cabin Republicans, America's oldest uh, and largest LGBT uh, PAC, along with many other community and civic outreach programs. Admittedly, as a Republican, I'm a bit of an anomaly. I'm a businessman, however, I'm pro-choice and pro-labor, having built companies that create union jobs, contributed to high-profile labor initiatives, and have supported workers' rights for teamsters, carpenters, electricians, decorators, hospitality, and more nationwide for nearly four decades. You know, it's just sad that we have 1,250 um, lockdown employees in Massachusetts here, and one of the initiatives I worked on was um, regarding prevailing rates for out-of-state workers. We're pulling them in and paying them time and a half for straight time, and now we're being threatened with rate hikes because the lockout is getting too expensive. They say it's time to end the lockout. Um, and beyond that, um, I am here to serve Rockland and, um, and to fill what is an unusual short term before our next election, which will come up even before the very next town meeting. Uh, that being said, um, I relent to the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kane. Mr. Gawkier. Okay, the first question we'd like, to, we'd like people to address is basically what each candidate does for a living. And uh, if you could tell us how your life experiences would, be a, uh, would assist the Board of Selectmen in governing the town. We'll start with Mr. Simpson. So as some of you do know, I am a police officer with the town of Rockland. Um, I've gone through the ranks and I've earned the rank of uh, sergeant currently a patrol supervisor um, within the department. Um, as you know, I, I, I've seen a lot, I've done a lot, and uh, my life experiences um, have been from my career. My, my mistakes have been from my career, and I've learned from them. Um, I've seen, I've been out in the community, I've seen our very hard times, I've seen people in despair, and um, I'm very proud to be the one that I can come when someone calls. Um, and it's even better when it's my, my own hometown. Um, as you know, um, I started my career um, as an auxiliary and moved to the ranks. Um, it was difficult with civil service. Um, I wound up having to go to the town of Hull for almost five years and fought very hard to come back here um, to be a police officer in the town of Rockland. Um, this is where I felt I belonged, I was comfortable, and I've um, taken every advantage that's come down the, uh, my way. I've trained young officers, I've trained veteran officers, I've held many different disciplines as instructors, and I'm getting to the age now that I'm that's passing the torch. Um, I'm a problem solver, I prepare cases, I prepare plans, and I think that'll be um, ideal for the role of selectman. Mr. Valenzuela. Thank you, Tony, very much for the uh, question. Um, <clears throat> what is my job? I presently sell uh, office products and workplace products for a uh, company based in Brockton that you might see advertising on Red Sox games, which the Red Sox also explain my hoarse voice these days. Um, I do have a bachelor's degree in political science with uh, a concentration in public administration. I am a former state senate aide. Formerly I worked retail and I also used to bartend. I have uh, some unique backgrounds and experiences in many different walks of life that I believe prepare me aptly to be a member of the Board of Selectmen. Part of being on the planning board and part of being on the school building committee is being able to work with folks who you may not necessarily have the same ideological belief with, but I have a proven track record over the last decade plus of serving the town of Rockland 
of rolling up my sleeves, listening to all points of views and opinions, and coming to the best conclusion for Rockland. Again, and, and I won't keep highlighting this project, but I believe that the project results that we're sitting in here the, at the Rogers Middle School highlight that, that sometimes we can all put aside our differences to work well together to come to the very best conclusion for Rockland. I've always put Rockland first, and I always will. Um, so, Thank you, Mr. Valenzuela. Before we go on to Ms. Lemon, I just would like to suggest to the candidates, to be fair, what I'm going to do is when you're approaching 10 seconds left in your time, I'm just going to raise that yellow card so you know you have 10 seconds. Is that okay with everybody? Great. Ms. Nyman. I am currently the public information officer for the Norfolk Sheriff's Office where I am responsible for crea creating and enabling the communication between the sheriff and the public, also with the newspapers as well. Uh, previously, I worked at the State House for six years where I gained um, experience with regard to the inner workings of government, the legislative process, and the complexities of our state laws and regulations. I've also val uh, fostered valuable relationships with many key legislators, legislative staff, and uh, state agency personnel. I believe that I could benefit from using those relationships to advocate for the town of Rockland. Okay, uh, I believe it's Mr. Penny's turn. Yeah, so as I covered earlier, I'm director of sales uh, for Johnson Lancaster in the Northeast. Um, it's $150 million a year equipment dealer. I'm responsible specifically for the Northeast, uh, between 40 and 50 million a year in sales and a staff of uh, 10 employees. Um, I've also been on a uh, member of the finance committee for over 10 years, <clears throat> starting when uh, the town was really in financial uh, difficulties, uh, all the way up to uh, when I just resigned in August, uh, being in uh, a very healthy financial position. So I also mentioned I've uh, been very involved in youth sports coaching, uh, but also sitting on a board uh, of a basketball program that uh, actually combined four different organizations into one. So one of my strengths is, is building teams. Uh, that's what I've done. Um, three different uh, organizations where they've asked me to come in and actually build teams and, and build an organization, uh, two of them from scratch. So I think those things in particular lend myself uh, to uh, being in a very good position for selectmen. Also in my uh, knowledge with the town and the finance, work closely with the, with the selectmen and other boards as well as our state representatives. So I think I'm very well positioned to, to take this role as selectman. Thank you, Mr. Kane. <clears throat> uh, yes, um, I, I am and will continue to be um, an exhibit designer and producer, uh, primarily for major conventions and conferences, but as well as museums, branded interiors, including a lobby treatment that we did here in Rockland back in the mid 80s that is still um, functioning f fantastically. <laughs> Very happy to say. So how, how might those skill sets um, prepare me to help serve Rockland as selectman along with the background I shared with you earlier? Um, throughout my career, my team approach in common sense management style has brought a fresh perspective to many complex and challenging projects and programs, both public and private. Um, from this experience, I've learned that listening, flexibility, and compassion are far more important than chest beating. Uh, it's not what I did yesterday, but it's what can I do for you tomorrow. And I look forward to hoping to help this community to continue to flourish and be proud. Thank you. Thank you. Great. The next question. Neighborhoods are concerned about impacts like opening the Union Street gate, cell towers, and a fire station. Do you think it's a good idea to locate a new fire station at the Rite Aid site and adjoining lot? Why don't we start with Mr. Kane? That's an awesome question. Um, it, as I observed the, um, the commercial realtors um, sign go up, um, I realized that in early December is the deal-making conference in New York City for the ICSC, the International uh, uh, Conference of uh, Shopping Centers, and I hope that they market that uh, vigorously. It was no secret several years ago that Walgreens was um, in the process of acquiring Rite Aid, and as part of the settlement for them to do so, they were required to leave 300 open Rite Aid brands. Uh, that location was very likely on the, their list, uh, their hit list, back about the time permitting was done, and it would have been a very 
um, convenient location, I think, for the fire station, maybe even more so than the existing Rite Aid location, but it certainly opens up that um, the possibility that, that that may be a better accessible place. I would definitely want to, um, you know, get way in from the, the chief and, and, and others in town concerning the planning and what um, the impact would be on traffic in that location. Thank you. Okay, thank you. If, if any time the candidates want me to repeat a question, uh, I'd be happy to do so. Um, Mr. Penny. So um, there are pros and cons on, on that. I mean, believe me, the fire station and the school, um, those projects, one of the struggles we have as a town is we just don't have a lot of space. Um, so there is no ideal spot. So the pros, um, it's good access uh, and it's a large enough piece of property. The possible cons, um, one of the busiest intersections in town. So that's, that could be a, an issue. The other issue potentially is the cost of the land. We don't own that. Uh, it's a prime, um, prime retail spot. It's going to be expensive. And the other issue uh, potentially is does it meet what the uh, mandates are to respond quick enough to, uh, to emergency calls? And that's something that really would, uh, would be on the fire chief and the, and the uh, building committee to make sure. I know one of the struggles that they face is trying to find a, a, a location that the fire station can exist in that they can actually meet the state mandates to, to get to all the calls. Because uh, if we can't, that may necess uh, necessitate a second satellite uh, station. I don't think any of us want to go to two stations versus one. Uh, thank you. Um, Ms. Nyman. I've talked to a few people um, currently on the fire department in Rockland, and there's definitely a need for a new fire station for sure. Um, the location, I don't know if that's a great idea. It sounds like a great idea, big, big enough space and everything, but like Rich said, the intersection right there. Also, it would um, increase the response time to get there from locations such as Hingham Street. So it's a complicated issue for sure. Um, maybe if we had some town land that we could buy it from and build a fire station there, that would be more beneficial for the town of Rockland. Thank you. Um, Mr. Valenzuela. Yeah, thank you, Jack. Um, so there is obviously a, a need for a new fire station, much like a lot of the other buildings that are in this town. They, it has served us extremely well, but it has certainly um, outlasted its time here. And uh, as we've embarked on, on building new buildings, uh, I think Rich alluded to the fact that the town of Rockland doesn't have an awful lot of available land. Uh, I had the pleasure of being at Chief Duffy's presentation of the Board of Selectmen last month on this issue. And I know once elected, I plan on leaning on him as a resource as well as the fire station building committee who are putting an awful lot of work into making sure we find somewhere feasible for a brand new fire station. Uh, the Rite Aid site, was it studied? Uh, folks have alluded to response times. I don't believe that site was a part of the study back when uh, that presentation was made. Um, so as it is right now, it's also valuable commercial space and could be utilized for reimagine Rockland and, and tie into the downtown redevelopment as opposed to a fire station. But as of now, um, I agree with the need for a fire station and look forward to working with um, others to find the best place for one. Mr. Yes, uh, great answers. Um, as we all know, the, the fire department got their, um, got the add on back almost 40 years ago. Um, we have one of the busiest fire departments on the South Shore. Um, I know that for a fact. Um, so we definitely de need a new facility. Um, I'm not necessarily familiar um, with the Rite Aid lot, the size of the lot, uh, the response times. Um, I would definitely um, seek advice from um, the fire station building committee, the fire chief, um, other firefighters, and try to get a plan in the works. And if, if this is something that is workable and cost effective, we'll go for it. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, again, we'll start with Mr. Simpson. Uh, do you favor a new combined uh, elementary school? Yes, I do. Um, the, I'm the type of guy, I, I want Rock, Rockland deserves the best. Rockland deserves new schools, a new fire station, and a few other projects that are in the, in the works. Bottom line, it comes down to the impact of the taxpayer. Um, what can we afford? Um, what, what funding we can get at state level? I know we're at a very high, I believe, 60% um, funding from a state level. Um, a reimbursement. Um, we're in a good position for that. 
But again, we have, we have projects in front of us, and it's gonna be not just me and not just the Board of Selectmen, it's gonna be the, 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 the voters of Rockland that if they wanna take on that type of burden, um, and it's, it, it's a pretty big issue. I can promise you as a Selectman that I will be um, gathering information, doing the research, doing the work for, yous, for, for you, and getting that plan together to give you the most honest, transparent plan um, that we can possibly come up with that is cost-effective and give what Rockland deserves. Thank you. Mr. Valenzuela, you're next. Yeah, thank you, Tony. Um, as Jim said, ultimately, this does become a decision that will be left up to the taxpayers of Rockland. As a member of the Elementary School Building Committee, I do support the idea of a combined elementary school uh, and for a couple of reasons. For one, the equity in education. Uh, imagine living in the district area, elementary school area where your kid goes to the brand new school, but you're on the other side of a fairly small town land-wise in Rockland and your child's going to a school that could be 60, 70 years of age. I think they're going to be a lot of upset parents. So it avoids us the ability to have inequity in, in education. It prepares our students equally with the same access to the same technology. And, um, and ultimately, um, it takes care of, frankly, one problem. Uh, the reimbursement rates from the Massachusetts School Building Authority don't come all that often. We're approximately five or six years outside of the MSBA for this project, and it would take a significant amount of time to replace the community elementary schools as they are right now. So I firmly support a brand new combined elementary school. I also support a combined elementary school. Um, growing up, I went to an elementary school that wasn't combined. Um, and I think it's beneficial for the children to go to the same elementary school growing up. So then when they, don't, when they meet in uh, middle school, they're familiar with the faces. They have friends that they went to school with from kindergarten up until middle school. Um, I think it's tough when you separate them at such a young age and then when they come together, I think it creates a lot of bullying as well. Um, I recently went to the school building committee. Um, happy to see Rich and Jared there as well and many of you in the audience. Um, they are doing a phenomenal job with trying to find a new location and um, options for a new elementary school in Rockland. So I commend them for their work. Um, my mom actually went to the Memorial Park School, so that kind of alludes to how old that school is. <laughs> Sorry, mom. But um, I would also advocate to the state legislature for funding to bring back to Rockland to build a new um, <coughs> elementary school. I know my father was very... Um, Sorry, <laughs> very instrumental in getting funding here for this beautiful school we're sitting in. So I would use my relationships um, and my prior knowledge to advocate on the state level to bring funding back to ease the burden on the taxpayers. Thank you, Mr. Penny. So uh, I am the chairman of the committee, so I wanna put that out there. So I personally support a combined elementary school. And the reason why, uh, Jared alluded to it, equity in, in the education. You know, one of the one of the challenges uh, is, you know, how big is a, a school uh, to handle a town? The benefit is being a small town, we're looking at a little over 700 kids. So, in the scope of things, it's not huge. So, I think it's very feasible. Um, but we have to go through a process. So, we'll, we've been working with MSBA, uh, working with the local legislators. Um, we're in a very very good position as far as reimbursement rates. Um, it's going to be in excess of 60% uh, as we kind of go forward. We've identified five locations. Uh, we've already eliminated one of those locations. It's not working for a number of reasons. And we'll continue to work on that. We have to look at it for the MSBA, both combined and, uh, and single. But at the end of the day, what my personal opinion is doesn't matter. It's up to the taxpayers. Uh, we need to give them all the information, and the taxpayers have to make the decision if it's right for them or not. Mr. Kane? <clears throat> yes. Um, one of the interesting uh, feedbacks that I got from meeting people through the uh, process of getting uh, nomination signatures and then doing some canvassing was that um, w when it came to the subject of the elementary school, people tended to want to gravitate back to the neighborhood school system that was, um, well, t t you know, again, w w this has come up concerning the square too, but I don't want to get off subject. But um, traditional uh, neighborhood type of environment, more intimate um, engagement with the younger people before they go on to middle school and high school. Obviously, um, the costs are extravagant 
and the land is scarce. We can't find enough space to build a fire station, but we're gonna build a school large enough to house all the elementary ch school children. I hope that can happen. Uh, but the next biggest challenge would most likely be in transportation and the cost to make sure that these students do get to school safely to one location from every part of Rockland. Great. Thank you. Uh, the next question is kind of a combination from the audience and uh, also from uh, the Chamber of Commerce. Um, if elected, what ideas do you have to attract businesses and developers who are critical to restoring Rockland's historic downtown? We can start with Mr. Kane. Uh, that's an excellent question. I think that um, one of the first steps, of course, would be to um, reach out to and try to partner with the Rockland Chamber of Commerce and um, the emerging nonprofit Reimagine Rockland, who have some lofty goals and seem to have a tremendous amount of um, uh, currency, if you will, in terms of attracting some uh, grant money to um, f for many improvements, uh, not just to parks and open spaces, but as well as um, <clears throat> the economic development in downtown. Um, I believe it was Jared that alluded to it earlier that even this Rite Aid closure could be looked at as an opportunity to expand some of the um, economic opportunities. The key is that we need, we need new, fresh ideas for people who want to come in and be entrepreneurs in a bedroom community in a, in a, in a downtown setting like this. Um, big, bo big box stores uh, stole a lot of that thunder from a lot of the individual entrepreneurs. Uh, and along with it, the internet's had a major impact too. So we, we need some fresh ideas. It just can't be, um, you know, uh, again, the suggestion was made another time about a restaurant row, very attractive idea, but um, it, it would take a pragmatic approach in seeing what's available for dollars to come in and, and see what we can do to, to clean up and deal with some of the issues that we have going on up there currently, uh, particularly with boarded up retail storefronts that are licensed to operate. Um, it, that, that one confounds me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Penny. So uh, downtown Rockland is one area, but we also have Union Point that we have to address. So it, it has to be kind of looked at holistically. But I'll, I'll talk about downtown in particular. So if you look at some of the towns that have had some relative su uh, success redeveloping, Dedham, Hudson Mass, uh, for two, um, they've started with uh, finding restaurateurs coming in. So one of the things that you have to do is drive foot traffic. So the, the way the downtown is, de is developed, we don't have a lot of parking, we don't have large lots. So it takes off the, the big box retail is or department store or a, um, or a supermarket. So how do you do this, right? So I think we have to develop ways for park, look at restaurant tours coming down, uh, drive some foot traffic, look at the artist loft uh, on East Water Street. You know, can we do something with them to actually do a storefront? Uh, we've got the 40B in place, I mean the 40R in place, uh, which will help. We have to really work with Reimagine Rockland, the South Shore Chamber of Commerce. Uh, they had a great event a couple of weeks ago where they actually had invited developers uh, to walk the town, uh, and it was a phenomenal idea. I think we have to continue to do that. We have to, we have to attract developers and uh, let them know that this is a place that, uh, that they want to do business in. Thank you. Ms. Nyman. So I had an office in Rockland, downtown area, uh, two years ago in my last campaign, and I looked out the window almost every day and saw the potential for downtown Rockland. Um, there's so many great things that could come into town, but first, before we bring developers and businesses in, I think we need to look at why are people going out of town? What do they want to come into town before we invest all, all these businesses to come in and then people not use them? So um, like I've said previously, talking um, with, the, with my fellow candidates, I would um, get a consensus from the town of what people want and then go from there. I've also been involved with um, MAPC, for those of you who don't know, it's the Metropolitan Area Planning Council and they do a lot with downtowns. They've co they came to Rockland a few times so I think being involved with them they could help us um, better, get a better vision for what type of businesses that we want to attract to the downtown. Also reimagine Rockland has done some great things so I think Rockland is on the path forward. Thank you. Mr. Valenzuela. Thank you, Jack. Um, I know Reimagine Rockland actually, I think, did a survey about a year or so ago regarding 
um, what folks would be interested in seeing in downtown Rockland and elsewhere. Uh, as a member of the planning board, one of the things that I see often uh, as we're doing projects is uh, the splintered approach in which you uh, come to Rockland. So for instance, you started planning and then you go to zoning and then you go to conservation. And if you have an update, you might have to restart that entire process again. And it becomes onerous for many developers to want to come and actually uh, invest their time and money into Rockland. Uh, several years back, uh, for one of the car dealerships, we did a best practices uh, combined planning, zoning, and conservation commission meeting. And I believe that that is a very functional approach to easing the burden of developers coming into town and wanting to invest their money and time. Uh, Rich alluded to the 40-hour zoning uh, for downtown Rockland. Uh, while obviously that's a tool, it's not something that folks are going to come into town and start uh, re making our uh, historical uh, makeup, it does offer developers an opportunity and a different approach to what downtown Rockland may look like, and it could very well entice some really decent opportunities to fill those vacant storefronts. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Simpson. She doesn't really leave much thunder left for me, huh? Gee. <laughs> <laughs> um, just to add to all those great answers, I would just allude to the fact that, um, you know, two main routes, 139 and 123, come to the town of Rockland. Uh, we have an on-ramp and off-ramp to the Pilgrim Highway with Route 3. Um, we're very accessible. We're kind of in the center of the universe uh, that we used to call it when we were a kid, right? So, uh, um, but again, uh, we have to be recruiters also. We have to support the businesses that are already in place that have been here for a long time. And we have to incorporate their ideas and we have to uh, bring, when we bring those other businesses in as they've alluded in the answers, what do you guys want? Um, wh wh where can we go from here? Um, and again, as a selectman, Let's get the plan together. It's a lot of work. Um, all the candidates here seem to be on the right page of it. We all, I drive up and down Union, uh, Union Street. We used to call it the Hill back in the day. There's plenty to do up there. Let's get it back. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay, um, the next question is for Mr. Simpson. We'll start with you. Uh, in your opinion, what do you think is the most important function for a Rockland selectman? A Rockland Selectman, the most important function obviously is, um, you know, a few things that I'm sure all sitting up here do every day. <clears throat> we have to be honest, high level of integrity. Um, we are in a leadership posi position of this town. Um, we have to work very hard to make that rough draft plan the, that we can produce to you and show you and explain to you and be transparent. Um, and again, also I'll use the word recruiter again. We may have some, um, under the authority of the selectmen, we have to fill certain positions. Well, I want the best and brightest. I want the people that are motivated to do right by the town of Rockland. They should come to work every day with uh, their motivation to, to serve our community and, and, this, and to fulfill that their duty that they've signed on to and they're being paid for. Um, that would be my function. Most important function would be, you know, the recruiter and bring, bringing people in. I thought he put the sign up, that's why I get sidetracked. <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, thank you. <laughs> okay. go, go, go ahead. Hey, thank Bell. you, Jim. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, as, as Jim alluded to, obviously someone with integrity, someone with honesty, someone who isn't afraid to, uh, to speak openly and honestly about perhaps some of the mistakes they have made in their past, and someone who's demonstrated a capability to grow from them and move on from them. Um, it was fun when I was chairman of the charter committee, you know, working on some different charter changes to watch the evolution of a Rockland selectman just from looking at old charters. Um, many sometimes have this idea that selectmen still sit at town hall for most of the day, running the day-to-day -day operation of the town, and they don't. Uh, the board of selectmen has evolved into being a part-time policy-setting board. Uh, one of the most important roles for our selectmen is to support all of our employees, whether it be our police, our fire, all of the town hall employees who, by the way, uh, had to withstand an awful summer uh, surrounding, uh, I'm sorry, an awful summer uh, of activity, media activity that surrounded the scandal. Uh, and it's important to create, benef uh, create policy that benefits everyone, that benefits all departments, that benefits every single solitary taxpayer and resident. I've always, uh, I have a proven track record of doing that and I will continue to do so on the Board of Selectmen. Thank you. Ms. Diamond? Well, there are uh, many functions for a selectman, like appointing a town manager who oversees the day-to-day -day operations of the town, um, holding public hearings, setting policies. I think the most important function of a selectman 
is to be a voice for the residents. Um, I think that is the main and most important function of a selectman, and I am confident that I could be a voice for the town of Rockland and the residents. Mr. Penny? So first, uh, selectmen don't run the town. I think people think they do. They don't. Uh, they have specific uh, responsibilities. With that, um, what are the most important functions to me? Work with all departments to bring a co uh, cohesiveness to town. The other is to answer to and be available to those who put us here, the townspeople. You put us in this spot, we need to be available, we need to answer to you. No hiding behind anything. Uh, look to help drive economic development. Help streamline the process, as Jared talked about. It's not easy for a business sometimes to come here. We need to get better at that and attract the businesses. Ensure those departments that report up through the Board of Selectmen perform at a high level. They're working on the odd behalf. We have to make sure that they do a good job. Uh, be forthcoming on all topics. Be as, as, uh, as, uh, as open and accessible as forthright as possible. Mr. Payne? Um, yes, the, the selectmen do not run the town, um, but they are um, looked at as leaders and we need to hold ourselves to a higher standard than others. Um, <clears throat> we certainly want to move on from any distractions of the past and concentrate on the future. The um, listening, engaging, um, participating with administrative support, particularly the financial committee and others in terms of turning out good solid plans for the town meeting to look at and for the citizens to vote on. Uh, th those are some of the things um, along with seriously weighing our decisions carefully in doing our homework and researching who's applying for licenses and what's going on behind the scenes with some of these corporations that have come in here like Walgreens. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, this will be a quick question for all of you, yes or no. Uh, it's a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, should the chairmanship of the Board of Selectmen be rotated on an annual basis? Mr. Kane, yes or no? No. Mr. Penny? Absolutely yes. Ms. Nyman? Yes. Mr. Valenzuela? Yes. Mr. Simpson? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, my next question is, for all the candidates, we'll start with Mr. Kane first. We started with Mr. Simpson three times. Um, uh, <laughs> Mr. Mr. Kane, why why do you think that you are the best candidate for Rockland for the Rockland's position of selectman among the other five? Uh, well, I'm a good candidate, and sometimes the best can be the enemy of the good. And um, uh, and um, truthfully, I, I you know my, my my background in business and in my community activism has always been one of complete transparency, of being approachable, of being flexible and listening to people, of being compassionate to what others' needs are, and not necessarily to any hidden agenda. Um, I believe that I would be forthright and truthful with everybody uh, as I am at the moment and um, you know I, it's um, it would be an honor to, to be on the board of selectmen and to help work this town uh, and, you know shape it into uh, everything it can be and should be Thank you, Mr. Penny. so I get 15 years of, of public service uh, youth sports finance committee uh, building committee uh, I've got 30 years professional experience running multi-million dollar businesses. I've hired over 150 individuals in my career, including directors and regional managers. We've got a couple of key hires coming up, and I think it's very important that we have some experience on that board to make sure that we hire the right candidates. Um, I have a history of building successful teams, um, both professionally and, and um, uh, on the youth side, although with John, not always, but um, we tried. Um, and that's one of the things that I can bring to the table, is bringing a team, uh, a team atmosphere, bringing bring cohesiveness, trying to um, elevate uh, the employees in town so we all look at, at, you know, holistically what's best for the town, not what's uh, each individual uh, um, department. 
Um, my motives are the same for 15 years. Um, do the best job I can do for the town. And uh, I've been very blessed uh, with a phenomenal family and with a, a career that has allowed me to do that. And uh, I truly like uh, giving back. And that's what I want to do. Thank you. Ms. Nyman? <coughs> You know I'm not um, a lifelong resident of this district. However, um, I have been coming to Rockland since I was about five years old alongside my father, um, helping those in need, delivering um, turkeys on Thanksgiving to seniors who aren't fortunate enough to be able to afford a turkey, um, delivering Mother's Day plants in Leisure Woods. I also am a new face to the town of Rockland. Maybe not a new face, but <laughs> I bring um, a unique set of skills, qualifications, and I think in a town that has faced some trying times over the past few months, I think we need to get some new blood in town hall, and um, I think I would be that face for you guys. Okay, thank you. Mr. Valenzuela. Thank you, Tony. So th I do want to say how privileged we are to have and to be running with these phenomenal candidates, and, and it's nice that I won't be the youngest one on the ballot for the first time in a while <laughs> running for office in Rockland. Uh, why am I the best candidate? As I alluded to in my opening statement, I firmly believe that I have a proven track record of working well uh, with folks across the board. Uh, some have alluded to party affiliations this evening. I'm nonpartisan when it comes to the Board of Selectmen. It's a nonpartisan position and it's a nonpartisan seat. The only R that I am beholden to is Rockland. Rich alluded to some very important hires coming up soon. The town administrator, perhaps being chief among them, and not too far behind the town accountant. These are serious positions. And these are positions that, if filled in correctly or with the wrong individuals, can have serious ramifications for the future of our town. There are so many wonderful things going on in Rockland, whether it be the holiday stroll, uh, Rockland Day, and so many other folks that have worked so very hard to rebrand and remake Rockland into a destination community on the South Shore. It's important to have a selectman who is passionate and willing to fight on behalf of each and every one of you on the Board of Selectmen. And that's what, makes, that's what I have done before, and that's what I will always do, and that's what I will continue to do on the Board of Selectmen. Mr. Simpson. Well, we have great candidates here, and it, w what puts me up a, a little bit better is possibly that uh, I've been in the community for over uh, 24 years with my career. Um, I solve problems every day. I make very unpopular decisions on occasion, um, and I'm willing to make those. Um, you know, the other thing, too, is as you can tell, I'm, I'm ex inexperienced with the political role, okay? I'm just a regular guy from the community, so I don't have any technical, you know, I've never been in the committees, I've never been in groups or whatnot, so I'm a clean slate, and I think that's what the selectmen could use this time around. Okay. So, uh, at this time, uh, I think we've discussed this, uh, it's, it's probably best because of our time frame to go to closing statements. Um, who would you like to start with, Mr. Rockland? Well, we'll start from the other end, Mr. Kane. Thank you. This um, is for two minutes. This shouldn't take two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, hello, I'm Brian Leo Kane, as I mentioned earlier, and I uh, recently relocated here to Brock Rockland, and um, to to uh, to live in a community that I've been very, very familiar with uh, for most of my lifetime. Um, even though I lived and grew up, raised my children in <coughs> surrounding communities, excuse me, I'm going to push the plug in a little bit. Um, I'm not emotionally attached to any of the political infighting or leveraging this as an opportunity to advance a political career. I came forward and delivered what I promised to the people who no signed my nomination papers, and that was a choice, not business as usual. I, like so many, were concerned and motivated, you know, by the events of this last summer, but also by what's been going on in downtown. Um, a year ago, coming up on the, on the stroll in the, excuse me, in the, in the holiday stroll, um, we're looking at nearly, you know, 20% or more dark storefronts this year. To me, that's sad. It was a really festive time last year, and even with the minimal amount of dark spaces that there were, there were going to be that many more this year. Um, I am, I'm going to close with a quote, one of my favorite quotes, and it was by John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Let us not seek the Republican answer or the Democratic answer, but the right answer. 
Let us not seek to fix blame for the past. Let us accept our own responsibility for the future. I promise to work vigilantly to help build community pride, restore confidence in the executive board, and keep Rockland strong. I hope that you will consider me on November 6th as a selectman for the five-month seat. Thank you very much, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Mr. Penny. Thank you. So November 6th marks one of the most important elections uh, for selectmen in recent Rockland history. With everything that's going on, uh, we've got a major development underway, which, uh, if those of you don't know, has run into a little bit of a, a roadblock. Uh, and we've got uh, two people, uh, Kelly McKinnon and Tom Hennison, who are working diligently to, to, to move that forward. Uh, we face two building projects uh, that are needed. Um, and if you don't, you don't think so, uh, contact the fire chief and the, and the superintendent. They'll take you through the, uh, the buildings. Um, but it comes with a cost. Uh, and uh, it's very hard to keep going back to the townspeople for more money. Uh, we need true proven leadership uh, with a vision to tackle what's coming up. Please take your time, all right? Learn the candidates. In the past, people have voted because they knew someone and it seen where we got us. Actually, try to find out the information about the candidates, all right? Make a smart decision. Um, everyone wants to talk about national elections. Local elections have more impact on you day to day than the national ones, all right? Um, I hope after looking at everybody, you, you take a hard look at me uh, and choose me uh, to be one of the candidates. I'll work hard, uh, I'll be available, I'll be visible, um, I'm easy to find, and I'll continue to be that way. All right, thank you very much. As I hope you've learned from me tonight, I have a strong passion for public service and helping others. I am for very fortunate to have had not one, but two people show me how public servants can make a difference in people's lives. I also have the real life experiences and education to understanding so many of the problems we face. And I'm eager to represent you on the Rockland Board of Selectmen. As I mentioned earlier, I wanna focus on the issues that matter like supporting projects for a new elementary school and fire station, revitalizing our downtown, and being an advocate for our veterans, seniors, and public safety personnel. I will also work to keep taxes low. I feel so fortunate to have been able to buy a house in this great community. I believe that we have to keep property taxes in check so that the next generation of homeowners can raise their families here as well. Part of the solution to being able to contain property taxes is to grow local businesses and the jobs and revenue they generate. In 1960, my grandfather started a business that is now successfully operating in its sixth decade of providing local jobs and local revenue. I understand how important these businesses are to our local economy, and I will be a strong advocate of small businesses and econo economic development in Rockland. And finally, as your selectman, I will always strive to be someone you are proud of, someone who demonstrates the level of commitment, integrity, and character you deserve in your elected leaders. I promise to bring respect to our conversation, truly listen to all points of view, and work together with fellow board members to find common sense solutions for our town. You deserve no less. I will continue to work hard over the next few weeks to earn your support. I encourage you to reach out to me with any questions you may have. Thank you all for coming tonight, and I'd be honored to earn your vote on Tuesday, November 6th. Thank you. Mr. Valenzuela. Thank you, Tony. Again, thank you to Tony uh, Gokia, Jack Ward, and uh, the Democrat and Republican town committees for putting this evening together. Uh, I'm passionate about Rockland. I've had the privilege of serving on the planning board and on the school building committee uh, for the last 12 years. Uh, I've also served as the Grand Knight of the Rockland Knights of Columbus, which has had me out in our community serving many folks, also delivering turkeys and securing wheelchair grants from uh, the Knights of Columbus for residents of our community that are struggling. I will never pretend to know the answer. I never have and I never will. I always seek and lean on those individuals who are experts in their positions. I've already met with Dr. Cron, our school superintendent, and school committee chairman Dan Biggins, and I'm steadily working my way to meeting with each department head between now and November 6th to learn more about what their needs are and what they need to talk about. Just yesterday I had a tour with Johnny Medlin of Rockland Athletic Supplies to learn more about downtown Rockland and what the Chamber of Commerce's positions are. I have a, we need a candidate for the Board of Selectmen who is unbound by the immediate past and who has the experience to work collaboratively. There are many folks who might be able to talk about being open-minded and understanding different points of view. I have a proven track record of rolling up my sleeves and doing the work for Rockland. You may not always agree with me, 
but you know that I will always do what's in the best interest of Rockland. We have great folks in Town Hall and across our many boards who need a passionate selectman who's willing to listen and work together with each and every person uh, serving our great community. Again, my name is Jared Valenzola, and I request your vote on Tuesday, November 6th for the one-year, five-month term on the Board of Selectmen. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Simpson. Well, I would like to thank everybody that brought us together tonight, both committees, uh, the moderator, the candidates. It's been a good set of candidates, huh? <laughs> so, um, listen, in closing, I just want to let you guys know, listen, I'm a Rockland kid. Uh, I raised my family here. Um, I care about every single person in this town, uh, whether you You've crossed paths with me, not like me, you, you, you respect me. I've earned people's respect, uh, I'm honest. Um, I stand tall in, the, in a lot of different faces uh, that I see on a daily basis. Um, again, I'm inexperienced when it comes to politics. Um, but you cannot deny that I speak from the heart, I care about my town, and um, I'm, I'm here to do the work for you. I'm here to get us uh, moving in that right direction. We have a few big decisions coming up that um, I want to work together with, with the current board, and, um, and, and just move us forward. These big projects, I think um, the vote on November 6th is probably the biggest one, as the, the, the other candidates have alluded to, for the next five to ten years with the projects that lay in front of us. So I want to do the research, I want to get the plans in place, and I want to, I want to get some things done. We, we deserve it. Um, our community deserves it, and every single person that, that sat here listening to me not tonight deserves it. So thank you very much. Well. I would like to thank all of the candidates who have uh, come forward tonight to uh, run for selectmen. I think you have a, some great choices to make. It could be difficult. Uh, but I urge you, uh, the most important thing you can do is vote. And not only should you vote, but you should encourage your friends, family members, neighbors, whoever, get out on November 6th and vote. So thank you for coming, and uh, we appreciate your support. Good night, Rockwell.